All right, Jeb will say good morning. Let us begin. We have a beautiful, beautiful death ahead of us today. Our share this morning is dedicated by our Talmud Torah sponsors, Paul and Kathy Pollack, in honor of their grandchildren. May they be Zochem Eretz Hashem to become the best version of themselves. Also, the Talmud Torah sponsorship by Daf Yomi Shun, the Schosso of Forshlema for Yehuda Ben Michal. Our week of learning sponsors, Jeff and Karen Cohn, in commemoration of the art site of Karen's mother, Mrs. Clara Oxman, on the 18th of Av. Our Daf Yomi sponsors today, Natan and Leah Berry, in commemoration of the art site of Leah's father, Tzvi Sharazan, Eliezer Avram Tzvi. Ben Psachia Leib Zechorn Levrach. We hope that in the merit of our Talmud Torah, all of the Nishav, all of the Nisham will have an Aliyah. The families in Nechama and all of those who need a Rafuah should have one together with Kol Chol Yisrael. I will say we have a beautiful daf, really fascinating daf ahead of us today. Today's daf is Lamed Tes thirty nine. We are picking up Emirat Hashem on the bottom of Lamed Ches Amud Beis Amar Abaye. Let's pick up six lines up from the bottom. Just also take the opportunity to thank Rabbi Kalman Akiba, to thank Rabbi Richter for giving the shir last, last week while I was away. Baruch Hashem, it's wonderful to be back uh, in person with all of you. And with that, let us begin. So I'm Rabbi, so we'll say some very interesting cases concerning the nature of the knas. I'm Rabbi, Ba'ala Umesa. What's the in the following situation? A man goes in and violates a woman and she dies. Now we'll say the case that we're talking about when she dies, if you look at Rashi, Ba'ala Umesa. The case over here is j- just the progression of events. A man violates a woman. Again, so a father, generally this is a process that's handled by the father. The father will take the man to Beisdin. Beisdin will go ahead and adjudicate the case. And if the man is truly guilty, then he'll pay the penalty payment. In this particular case, what happened over here is as follows. Man violated the woman. Ruvain violated Rachel. But before Rachel's father had an opportunity to bring the case to the Beisdin, Rachel died. Rachel died. Again, I want to be clear. Not died a result of the, of the violation. Because that, that's a separate case. Now then suddenly this has transformed from a violation case to a murder case. This is talking about she, Rachel was violated and then unfortunately she was, uh, she was hit by a bus. So, so death totally unrelated to the events that occurred beforehand. What's the halacha? Potter, Ruvain, the perpetrator, is Potter from paying the knas, Potter from paying the penalty payment. Why is that? We've actually seen this before. Shinamar, benasan avi anara, below the avi mesa, because the Pasik says that the violator will pay the avi hanara, the father of the girl. Girl naara meaning that she's alive, below la avi mesa, and not to the father of the deceased. So a drasha, a drasha on a pasik, that the penalty payment is only paid to the father of the victim when the victim is alive. Okay, so the Gemara says, Milsa de pshit le la abaye me baile le rava. Something that Nabo say, abaye, abaye, sees this as a clear, straightforward limud. Right? Straightforward halacha. Namely, again, halacha la maisa, man violates a woman, woman dies. Violator is not subject to paying the fine. So the Gemara says that which was obvious to Abaye was actually not so obvious to Rava. The Gemara says, So Nilsa de Pshil Abaye mi baile de Rava, de Bai Rava. We'll say, Rava asked an interesting question. Yesh beger bekever. Yesh beger bekever. Is that literally translated, it means, is there the concept of bagros in the grave? Now let's go back for just a moment. We know that in the process of a girl's maturation into womanhood, there are, three, there are three stages, as we'll see in just a moment. There's when she's a kitana, a na'ara, and a bogaris. Now, we know also something very interesting, which is that based on the drush and the psukim, the din of, the din of, of ones, the din of, uh, of violating, when a man violates a woman, the whole halacha that we have, namely that he has to pay the penalty payment, only applies when, only applies when, when she's a na'ara. She's an ara. They both say that's just based on the gzera sakasim, just based on the psukim. So in other words, the penalty pay, now we'll, we'll qualify this in just a little bit, but the, what we call the 50 silver piece, the 50 shekel penalty payment only applies in a situation where a man violates a nara. 
Okay, so here's the following situation. Look at Rashi for just a moment. Yesh beger bekeber. Look at Rashi. Emesa bena arusa ad shelo amda bedin v'egiyazman bagrusa bekeber michashiv beger or lo. So we'll say what the question seems to mean is like this: that Allah chalamaisa. Do we look or do we do? Does the clock does the clock keep running? even once the girl has passed away. Now, what's the nafkamina for that, Jabot say? Take a look at Rashi. Yesh beger bekever, the last Rashi on the daf. Fichi hechi dim lo espika la'amod bedin ad shebagra, t'na l'kama b'parak narash n'espasa d'hare heim na'atzma, v'lo l'avya, v'hash t'nami beger bekever mafkia ko'ach ha'av, u'bena yaris la imi yish la'bein. So I'll say, here's the interesting case. Here's the interesting case. What happens, halacha l'maysa, if we take a step back, let's leave it, remember, how did this whole sugi start? Whole sugi started was Abai came along and said, Ruvain violated Rachel, right? Rachel died before the court case had an opportunity to get started. So in that particular situation, how do we paskin? How do we paskin? That ultimately Ruvain is off the hook for the penalty payment. Zerah Sakasov, it's a technicality. The Gemara says, by the way, for, for Abaye was Pashit, for Rava is a question. Because Rava brought up the following situation, right? The, that's how the Ba'i Rava, Rava was asking, Yesh Beger Bekever. They both say, here's the question that Rava's asking. Ruvain violates, Ruvain violates Rachel. Rachel is a Na'ara. They go ahead and they begin the court process. Right? That's what Rashi points out over here. Mesa ben Arusa, Achlo Amdabedin. I'm sorry, they do not yet begin the court process. And then what happens? Rachel dies. Rachel dies. Now what? Now watch this. Now even though Rachel died, Bezdin continues the process. By the time they go ahead and they reach the verdict that Ruvain was guilty of violating Rachel, Rachel would have been 13 years old. 13 years old. 13 years old is what? Is what? Is a Bulgaris. Then I both say, we're going to see something interesting. There's a whole confluence of events happening over here. We're going to see that. Let, let's take a, one more case. One more case. Ruvain violates Rachel. Okay? Rachel's alive. Rachel's alive. They go to Beisdin. Takes Beisdin a little bit of time. By the time Beisdin goes in and passes the verdict that Ruvain is chayiv for violating her, Rachel is 13 years old. She's a Bulgaris. So now Ruvain's going to pay the penalty payment. Who gets the penalty payment? Who gets the penalty payment? So we haven't seen this yet, but we're going to see in a few days from now that if the verdict is passed when Rachel becomes a Bulgaris, she gets the money. She gets the money. She gets the money. Okay, so remember, even though obviously she was violated when she was a Nara, but now when a girl becomes a Bulgarian, she's a full-fledged adult. So therefore, again, her own personal autonomy, she gets the penalty money. Here's Rava's question. Now, now watch Rava's question. Rava's question is this. Ruvain violates Rachel, right? So Rachel dies. Rachel dies, but Bezdin is still adjudicating the case. By the time Bezdin adjudicates the case, had Rachel been alive, she would have been 13 years old. So here's the Shaila. Yesh beger bekever. Could it sound strange, but can a girl reach bagros in the grave? In other words, how do we look at Rachel now that she has passed away? Do we look at the age she would have been had she been alive? And had she been alive, she would have been 13. And therefore what? Therefore what? Who gets the knas? Who gets the knas? Now Rachel. The problem, of course, is Rachel's dead. So who would get the knas in her stead? Let's say she left behind the child, which we're going to challenge. Let's say she left behind the child. So maybe the knas would go to her heir, to her child. Or do we say, ain't beggar bekever? No, 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 no. There's no bagros. There's no bagros in the grave. So essentially, once the girl dies, what happens? What happens? The clock stops, and she essentially halachically remains forever a na'ara, which then means that when the Beisdin finds Ruben guilty of, per, of, of violating Rachel, who gets the money? Who gets the money? Her father. Now, I will say, before we even delve into this case, what's the point of the Gemara over here? The point is, you see that according to Rava, Rava seems to feel that even once the girl has died, the proceedings against the violator can still continue. So that stands in contradistinction to Abaye. Because remember, again, Abaye started by saying, once the girl died, once the girl died before the Bezdin proceedings got started, what's the halacha? What's the halacha? We're done. We're done. In other words, at least we're done with the penalty payment. We're done. We're done. You, the point the Gemara is saying over is, you see, according to Rava, 
Rava says, no, we're not done. Because what is Rava, what is Rava trying to understand? Rava is asking, at the end of the day, who will get the penalty payment once they go out and they reach the verdict? If you say, yesh beger bekever, that a girl could become a bogeres even in the grave, then her heir, her heir, her child, will go ahead and get the penalty payment. If you say, ein beger bekever, the father will get the penalty payment. But what you see according to everyone, or, or see according to Rava, is that the proceedings continue even once she is no longer in this world. To which the Gemara says, do we say a girl could become a bulgaris in the kever and therefore ultimately the penalty payment goes to her child, her heir? Or maybe no, there's no bagras in the grave. And therefore, once she passes away, again, her age is kind of frozen in time. Her age is frozen in time. But let's say, you know, one, of, one of the interesting questions that, uh, that is often asked regarding Trias HaMesim, Right, when Mashiach comes in Meretz Hashem B'Sha'a Tova Um Metzlachos, right, B'Karov, so on his resurrection, what age do people come back as, right? In other words, it's an interesting, it's, again, this is an interesting, do you come back at the age that you passed away at? Do you come back as a baby reborn? Do you come back, interesting, so it's just fascinating that almost the better than this Yesh Begir Bekever, is, is there the concept of halachic aging in the grave or not? Or at the end of the day, ultimately, again, does death say, what you, your status at the time of your death is the status that's locked in? So the Gemara says, one second, we both say, top of Lamates. So we'll say, let, let's, let's analyze this. So we, we have two things going on over here. Number one, a fundamental machlokes is can you initiate proceedings against the violator once the, once the girl has died? Abaye says no. Rava seems to say yes. Now in Rava, then there's another question. What's the other question? Yesh beger bekever. In beger bekever, do we view the girl's age and do, do we look? Do we look at the girl? Do we look at the girl's potential age at the time of the verdict? And therefore, again, had she been alive, she would have been a bogeres. Therefore, the penalty payment goes to her heir or in beger bekever. No, once she dies, her age is locked in. She's forever looked at as a nara, and therefore, if the violator is found guilty, the penalty payment goes to the father. So I will say, if you hold yesh beger bekever, that means that by the time they reach the verdict. The girl would have been a bogeres, so therefore it goes to her heir. And the Gemara says, who's her heir? Her child. The Gemara says, her child? Umi ma'abra? Could this girl have become pregnant? In other words, we'll say, remember again, we're talking about at the time of violation, the girl could not have been more than what? Been more than how old? 12 years old and six months. So the Gemara, let's just be less than that. Vatani, we learn, Rabbi, Vatani, Rabbi, become Idram Nachman. Rabbi, we thought before Rav Nachman, Shalosh Nashim Misham Shos Bemoch. Well, so we've had this Gemara a number of times, twice, to a couple of times in Yavamas already. So, Shalosh Nashim Misham Shos Bemoch. Well, so there are three women who are permitted to use a moch. A moch is a cloth. This was a Talmudic form of birth control. So, we'll say essentially was this is a barrier method of birth control. The cloth could either be inserted before, before relations, the cloth could also be inserted after relations, but obviously not as effective. But Lamai said this is a barrier form of birth control. So the Gemara says, three women are permitted to go ahead and use birth control. Eiluhein, these are the women. Kitana umeuberes umeinika. A kitana, who's a girl who's a minor. Meuberes, a woman who's pregnant. Meinika, a woman who is nursing. Why? Kitana shemetis aber vetamos. So we'll say kitana because it would be dangerous for a kitana to become pregnant. Right? Her body cannot handle that, that type of event and therefore she would die. So because for a kitana it would be sakanas nafashos, ultimately she's permitted to use this moch. Mu'uberes, mu'uberes, a pregnant woman. Shematasa ubra sandal. I will say there was this, there was this tamuric fear that ultimately, again, a woman who is pregnant could become pregnant again with a second pregnancy. And therefore, halacha lamaisa, it could go ahead and impact the first fetus. Again, I will say, j- just to point out, so you could have situations where a woman who is pregnant could have an ectopic pregnancy. But lamaisa, again, remember, whenever you see these fears about chazal regarding, regarding science, so again, this is based on their understanding of medicine. It's not halachic, it's, it's, it's societal, it's contemporary. So halacha lamaisa, again, a pregnant woman, they were concerned that if she become pregnant again, it can negatively impact the first fetus. And ultimately, meinika, shematik malaspinah. So a, a nursing mother, they're concerned that if a nursing mother becomes pregnant, it will 
diminish her milk supply and ultimately negatively impact her baby who she is nursing. So the Gemara says, kitana. By the way, it's a kitana. So mibat mibas achat esrei shana v'yom echad ad shteim esrei shana v'yom echad. So what's a kitana? A kitana ultimately is from eleven years old in one day to twelve years old in one day. Pachos mikan v'yeser alkein mishameshes kedarka balvachas div Rabbi Meir. Less than that age or older than that age, she can have relations normally without any type of protection. Because again, younger than that age, apparently there's no way she's going to become pregnant. And I will say, again, just to be clear, Chazal are not condoning or not encouraging these types of relationships. We're just talking about from a pure halachic perspective. So again, older than that age, obviously she's old enough, at least Bismana Gimara, to go out and become pregnant. The Chachamim say, in all of these cases, birth control is not permitted. Kaddish Baruch will have Rachmanis on these women. So we'll say, this happens to be a fascinating sugya. This is the sugya of birth control. And whether or not, again, birth control is permitted or not. And in the, in the halachic discussion of birth control, there are kind of two, two, two different schools. I mean, there's more than two, but two different schools of thought. The first of Rabbi Meir's school of thought says that when pregnancy poses an active danger for women, halacha lemaisa, again, the use of birth control is going to be permitted. Now, again, I will say in the world of birth control, there are also different forms of birth control. Here is actually interesting. The Gemara is talking about a very a significant form, like a barrier form, which is considered to be a, a heightened form of birth control. Okay, then you have the school of thought of the Chachamim. And the Chachamim say, pregnancy always carries risk. There's no such thing as a risk-free pregnancy. Pregnancy, by definition, constantly and consistently poses a mortal danger to both the mother and the fetus. That's the nature of it. When it comes to things that are inherently dangerous, but they're also part of day-to-day living, we employ the concept of Shomer Pesayim Hashem. Shomer Pesayim Hashem means Hashem watches over the simple people, which essentially is the halachic license to engage in dangerous activities because they are considered to be parts of everyday life. Rabosai, remember again, driving a car. Driving a car, I don't know what the statistical probability of chas v'shalom, getting into a fatal car crash is every time you get behind the wheel, but it exists. Lo aleinu, but it exists, right? That, that risk exists. I say, if it exists, then how are we permitted to drive? Because at the end of the day, there's a concept of I have to watch over my health. I have to stay away from life-threatening situations. So how, how am I allowed to drive if driving carries with it a statistical probability of risk? And what's the answer? It's part of activities of daily living. And we'll say, contrast that with skydiving. I will tell you, if somebody were to ask me, is it halachically permitted to go skydiving? The answer is unequivocally no. No. No, there, there's, why, why play, I, I, but, yeah, I love it, but it's less risky, skydiving is less risky, da, 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 da. that's fine, but jumping out of an airplane is, is a risk that is just unnecessary, you don't need to do it, if your life is not exciting enough without skydiving, see me after this year, I'm happy to give you plenty of other suggestions for things you could do, right? So let's say, but, but La Maisa, this is very important because this is the concept of Shon Pesam Mishos. The Chacham say, this is really fascinating, hashkafically and halachically. The Chacham essentially say, even in these situations where pregnancy poses a danger, birth control is Aser. Birth control is Aser, right? Why? Because by definition, getting pregnant is, we'll call it an activity of daily living. It always comes with risk. But yet we do it anyway because it's part just of the activities of daily life. And I will say, I want to point out that there are poskim like this. The Sat Murav, Zecher Sadevikadish Lebracha, was known as a kanoi against the use of birth control, even in, even in situations where there might have been a potential risk to health because of Shor Pesayim Hashem. Incredible idea. I will say, so okay, let's, let's get back. So here, here's our problem. So let's go back. Let's just retrace our steps. So Rav is asking, do we hold yesh beger bekever in beger bekever? If you hold yesh beger bekever, that a girl could become a bulgaris even in the grave, that means if the Bezin finds Ruvain guilty of violating her, halacha lamaisa what? The knas will go to her offspring. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. How could she have offspring? 
How could she have offspring? So if he tame the Abra Kishi Nara, Boli the Kishi Nara, so maybe she became pregnant when she was a Nara and gave birth when she was a Nara. Here's the problem. Obishi Siyachimi Kayalda, but say, how long is Narus? How long is Narus? Six months. A girl can't become pregnant to give birth in six months. Bamar Shmuel, ain't be Narus la Bagros, ala Shisha Chadoshim. There's only six months between Narus and Bagros. Maybe Chazamant was like this. There's no less than six months between Narus and Bagros. But what? But what? Could be more. Could be more. Gemara says no. Ha Ella Kamar. Both say Gemara use lotion of Ella. Ain be Narus la Bagros. Ella Shisha Chadoshim. Ella means what? Ella means what? Only. Only. There's only six months. So therefore, I will say, the idea, the idea of a Nara having a child who could potentially inherit the Knas seems to be impossible. Ella, Gimar says, you're right. Ella, the Gimar says, I'm um, sorry. Ella, I can by me. This is what Ravo was asking. Yesh beger bekever. Here was Ravo's question, I will say. Yesh beger bekever. Upaka av. Do we say that halacha lemaisa? There is beggar bekever. But say so. Beggar bekever means again. I just want to be clear. This is talking about a specific case. Ruvain violated Rachel when she was a nara. Rachel dies, unrelated to the violation. Bezdin begins its proceedings, finds finds Ruvain guilty. But at the time of the verdict, had Rachel still been alive, she would have been thirteen years old. She would have been thirteen years old. So do we say yesh beggar bekever? Do we say that a girl could become a Bulgaris from the grave? So do we say that? So listen to this. So this was Rav's question. Yesh beger bekever upaka av. So both say, do we say yesh beger bekever? And what that means, yesh beger bekever, is the father loses his rights. Now I both say, what happens in this case when the father effectively loses his rights? What happens? Who gets the knas? Who gets the knas? No one. No one. So I will say, this becomes what we call mamon she'in latovin. Money for which there is no claimant, which effectively means that what? Ruvain doesn't have to pay. Ruvain doesn't have to pay. Levashi says, Remember again, this is very important. This is a knas, this is a penalty payment, not mamon. Knas is not inheritable. Knas is not really inheritable. So therefore, in this kind of case, if you hold in beggar bekever, Right, I'm sorry, if you hold Yesh Beger Bekever, that means ultimately again, the father, right, the father really has no rights, and therefore Halacha Lamaisa, Halacha Lamaisa, Ruben doesn't have to pay anyone. Old Dilma ain't Beger Bekever, Philopakov, or maybe not, maybe ain't Beger Bekever, in which case we still look at this girl, Rachel, as a Nara, as a Nara, and therefore Halacha Lamaisa, when the Bayesden finds Ruben guilty, Ruvain will have to pay the father. So we'll say that was the Shaila. That was the Shaila ultimately again of Rava. So we'll say, Mar Baravashi So we'll say, so I just want to point out over here, what we have right now is a Machlokes Abaye and Rava. According to Abaye, Abaye holds once the girl dies, the process for the Knas is shut down. There's, there's nothing more to talk about. There's nothing more. So according to Abaye, there is no discussion, yesh beger bekever, ain beger bekever. That, that discussion doesn't move. Once, once Rachel dies, so we're talking about over here, a very specific case where Rachel died, when? When? Before the court proceedings began. Because if Rachel died after the court proceedings began, that's, we'll deal with that case separately. Right now, she died before the court proceedings began. Sabai says, if she died before the court proceedings began, we're done. There's no kanas. There's no kanas. Rava seems told that we could continue the court proceedings even after she died, even after she died, or I should say, we could begin the court proceedings even after she died. And therefore, according to Rava, I have the Shaila of Yesh Beger Bekever or Ein Beger Bekever. So Mar Baravashi Bai Lehachi, Mar Baravashi asked the following Shaila, Misa Ose Bagrus, or Ein Misa Ose Bagrus. So we'll say, Mar Baravashi asked, the, he asked a little bit differently. He said, does Misa affect Bagrus? Does Misa essentially affect instantaneous Bagrus or not? To which the Gemara answers, Teku. Okay, to which the Gemara ultimately says, we're not sure. Fine. So, we'll say again, well, I just want to point out the way we paskin, the way we paskin is we paskin like Abaye, and therefore the Raman paskin is, if the girl dies before the proceedings began, there's no knas. 
there's no knas. Again, because the Rambam accepts a Joshua ben Asan la avia na'ara, velo la avi mesa. So therefore, both say, once you pass in like Abaye, then obviously the whole discussion of yesh beger bekever in beger bekever is, is irrelevant. Is irrelevant. So I'll say that's how you pass in. If Reuven violated Rachel and Rachel died before the court proceedings began, then halach lamay said, in that situation, there is no knas penalty payment. Again, like I said, we'll see on daf mem alif. What do we do if she dies after the court proceedings began? We'll get to that. Next case. Rav asked Abayi the following kasha. Here's an interesting case. Reuven violates Rachel. Reuven violates Rachel. And then what happens? Rachel has Erisin with another man. Right? Rachel, Rachel decides that she's going to marry, she's going to marry someone else. So she, right, Rachel accepts Erisin from Shimon. So we'll say, so, so now what's so what's that? So now what's the Shaila? The Shaila is who gets the penalty payment? Who gets the penalty payment? Does Rachel get the penalty payment because now she's in Arusa? Or ultimately, again, does her father still get the penalty payment? Mahu, Amrle, Mik Siv Vinasan La Aviana Arasha Lo Arusa. Does the Pasik says you shall does the Pasik say you shall give to the father of the girl who is not in Arusa? In other words, just because Rachel is in Arusa. Why would that preclude the father from going in and getting the penalty payment? I'm sorry. So we'll say, yet yeah, we learned in a so we're going to see this later on as well. If Ruvain violates Rachel, and then Rachel gets married, not to Ruvain, to someone else, to Shimon, to Shimon, and we'll say the halacha is Rachel gets the penalty payment. Rachel gets the penalty payment. So does the Pasik say you shall give to the father of the girl who's not in a sua? In other words, why don't we give it to the father in that case as well? To which the Gemara tell you, here's the fundamental difference. Now, both say this is very important. We're going to see these concepts a little bit later on as well. Both say, Halacha Lemaisa, Halacha Lemaisa, if Ruvain violates Rachel, right? Ruvain violates Rachel. And by the time the Basin gets to adjudicate the case, Rachel is a Bulgaris. Who gets the money? Who gets the money? Rachel. Why? Because both say, what does Bagrus do? Bagrus removes a girl from a father's domain and gives her her own autonomy. She is her own independent person. So for some reason, Bazin only got around to passing the verdict when she, once she's a Bulgaris, ultimately, again, she gets the Knas money. Same idea, I'll say, what does Nisuin do? What does Nisuin do? Nisuin marriage removes a girl from her father's domain and gives her autonomy. It's true she's in her husband's domain, but gives her own autonomy. Right? So therefore, I will say, it's, it's, it's interesting. Therefore, halacha lamaisa, these two cases are similar. So therefore, if Ruvain violates Rachel, and then Rachel becomes a Bulgaris, Rachel gets to keep the knas. Similarly, Ruvain violates Rachel, then Rachel gets married, Nisuin. Then Bazin passes the verdict, Rachel gets the knas. Because those two states, Bagrus and Nisun, are similar. They both vest Rachel with complete autonomy. Contrast that, contrast that. Ela Erusin, mi kamafki mirshu se de avlegame. I will say, when a girl accepts Erusin, does that fundamentally remove her from her father's domain? And the answer is no. After all, Hatsanan, we learned, Naraha meurasa, avio ubaila, mefirin la nedareha. Now, we'll say, what did we learn? That ultimately, again, when a girl is betrothed, when ultimately she has erusin, I will say, how does it work with the revocation of her vows? Both her father and her husband have the ability to do so. So you see from here that erusin, erusin, does not go ahead and vest a girl with full autonomy by removing her from her father's domain. So therefore, I will say, halacha lemaisa, three halachas come out of this. Halacha number one, if Reuven violates Rachel, and by the time Bezdin goes ahead and passes the verdict, Rachel is a Bulgaris, she gets the money. Halacha number two, halacha number two, Reuven violates Rachel, Rachel then gets married, Nisuin to Shimon, Bezdin passes the verdict that Reuven is Chayiv, right? Rachel gets the money. Halacha number three, Reuven violates Rachel, Rachel accepts Nis Erosin, Erosin from Shimon, Bezdin passes the verdict, Father of Rachel gets the money. That's the three Allah, Shabbos said. Beautiful. So we emerge over here 
with four, with really four halachas, the three that we just mentioned, and the original one, namely, that if Ruvain violates Rachel and Rachel dies, a death unrelated to the violation, ultimately there is no longer any kinas payment that he, that he is chayiv. Beautiful. Says the Mishnah, Hamefate no sin shlosha devarem ba'ones arba, so we'll say now we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and get into the discussion regarding the mafata versus the ma'anis. Up until now, we've been focusing on ones, on, on the man who violates the woman. We'll say there is another parallel case of mafata, a man who seduces a woman. So we'll say the Gemara says, so Mishnah says this a mafata, no sin shlosha dvarim, a man who seduces a woman pays three, three buckets of three, we'll call the three things. Va'ones arba, and the man who violates a woman pays four payments. Let's analyze this. I'm a fat and no, so what does the mafata, what does the seducer pay? Boshes u pegam u kinas. So the mafata pays boshes, which is humiliation, pegam, depreciation, and kinas, which is the penalty payment. Most if I love ones, shenosin es tsar. We'll say the man who violates a woman pays a fourth payment, which is tsar, pain, pain and suffering. Pain and suffering. Ma bein ones le mefata. What is there between ones and mefata? Ha ones no sin es atzar. Va mefata eno no sin es atzar. Number one difference is the ones pays for pain and suffering, which makes sense, right? The mefata, the seducer, because at the end of the day, this was consensual. Ultimately, again, consensual with it, with a nara. I just want to be clear. So obviously, I will say that's why there's a penalty payment because this man is obviously taking advantage of this girl. So again, but there's not going to be tsar. There's not going to be pain and suffering. We'll say another interesting, a couple of interesting distinctions. Ones, if a man violates a woman, he pays the penalty payment immediately. Immediately. Vamefata lechishiyotze. Now, what is interesting, the mefata, the seducer, only has to pay the penalty payment in the event of the dissolution of the marriage. Now, we're going to see what that means, because that sounds like they're automatically getting married, which is not the case. We'll see what it means. Actually, take a look at Rashi. I'm going to ruin it a little bit for you, because Rashi says it over here. Five lines up for the Bible in Rashi. Lechishi Yotzi. Begimara parach atu ishtohi. I don't understand. Is, is, we're going to see that by the mefata, by the mefata, when a man violates a woman, he has an obligation to marry her, and the violator has no choice. The father of the girl or the girl herself has a choice. But the man who violates, ultimately, again, if the father or the girl want, want, to, want the marriage to proceed, the violator doesn't have a choice. In the case of the seducer, everyone has a choice. Every, everyone has a choice to make over here. So the Gemara says, the Gemara Rashi says, the Gemara parech atu ishtohi umefarish lo lechishelo yichnos dim konsa eno no sin kinas. We'll say we're going to see that halach alamais in the case of the seducer, the only time he pays the penalty payment is if he doesn't marry her. If he marries her, ultimately, again, there is no penalty payment. If halacha lamaisa, again, he does not marry her, that is when there is going to be a penalty payment. Again, we'll see this in the Gemara. Ones, we're going to see that halacha lamaisa, no matter what, there is a penalty payment. So the Gemara goes right. Ones, so the ones, was the man who violates the woman, literally drinks out of his pot which is the metaphor for saying, no matter the type of woman that he violated, he must marry her. He has a halachic obligation to marry her. But the seducer, Again, we'll see exactly what this lushan means, I will say, but the pashtos, what it means is, the seducer has a choice about whether or not he wants to marry this woman. What does it mean that the violator has to drink out of his pot? Even if she's crippled, or she's blind, or she's covered with boils, if this is the woman who he violated, this is the woman who he is obligated to go ahead and marry. However, the Gemara says, O she'ena ru'uya, lavo bekal Yisrael, lavo be Yisrael, eno rasha lekaima. There is an exception to this rule. If he violated a woman who he is not allowed to marry, let's say Ruvain violated Rachel, and Rachel is a mamzeres. So in that case, Reuben is not allowed to marry her. In that case, obviously, the penalty, the, right, the, the halacha does not require her to marry her. It does not require him to marry her. The Pasuk says by the violator, she must become his wife. That presupposes that what? 
that a halachic marriage is permitted between Ruven and Rachel. So let's analyze what we'll say. Tsar Demai. So we'll say one of the interesting distinctions now between Ones and Mefata. So now what we've seen is like this. The seducer pays three payments. Three payments, right? Boshes, humiliation, begam, depreciation, and kinas, the penalty payment. The violator, the ones, the, the ones pays a fourth penalty payment. What's the fourth penalty payment? Tsar, pain. So we'll say, the most interesting question, Tsar demai. When we say Tsar, what Tsar are we referring to? They both say, it sounds like a strange question, but you're going to see why the Gemara is asking it. Amr Avu Shmuel, Tsar Shechavtalo al Agabe Karka. It must be the Tsar that he threw her down to the ground. The idea being over here that this obviously is a violation. So therefore, again, he, 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 he must have used force. And therefore, the act of throwing her down to the ground obviously caused her pain. And they both say, you're going to see why, why the Gemara, there's so much, there's, there's a much, more obvious pain, right? The actual just pain of intercourse, the actual pain. So we'll say, we're going to see the reason that the Gemara does not automatically jump to that is because the Gemara assumes that the first act of relations is always going to be painful for a woman, right? The, what, the, the, any, the first act of relations, which ruptures the basulim, is always going to be painful. So the Gemara <laughs> seems to feel that this case, there must be some additional level of tsar. In other words, since the tsar of the Bia Rishona is just, so to speak, a fact that she's going to have to endure, is that that the Gemara assumes that maybe there's a different kind of tsar over here. That's why the Gemara doesn't start with the actual pain of intercourse, because we assume that pain is going to have to be endured at some point in time. So it says the Havamin, maybe it's a different kind of tsar. So maybe it's the tsar that is throwing her down to the ground. So maskif for Rabbi Zira, Elami Atta Chavta La Gabi Shirain, Hachanabi Depater. Okay, so what happens if he threw her down on a bed of silk? So there's no pain of being thrown down. Then what? He's going to be putter from Tsar? So maybe you'll say yes. So listen to this. Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda saying to Rabbi Shimon, Ones doesn't pay Tsar. Why doesn't he pay Tsar? Because the Bible says she is going to have this pain with her husband. In other words, the Bible say. If you think it's about the tsar of the bia, the tsar of the bia is going to be is going to be incurred anyway, even if she were to get married. Amrulo to which the Gemara says no. Ain adoma nivelas ba'onis the nivelas parasa. So we'll say the Gemara has to work through this. Chas v'shalom. We'll say you can't compare you can't compare the the discomfort that may be experienced in the bia rishona of a secure and loving marriage with the pain of a Bia Rishona with a woman who's being violated. In other words, they're both saying, what, I just want to show you what's just happened over here, which is really quite interesting, which is that, see, and this is sometimes when we discuss sensitive issues in Gemara. So Gemara, Gemara is a book of Halacha. Halacha, all, all of it just has to look at facts in a dispassionate way. So when the Gemara talks about the tsar of a woman being violated, the Gemara says, well, one second, from a purely analytical perspective, if we're going ahead and looking at the tsar as the tsar that a woman has from a first act of relations, well, she's going to have that tsar anyway at some point in time when she gets married. So ultimately, again, is that can't be the tsar that we're referring to over here because the tsar of Ones is something additional, to which the Gemara says, sometimes you can't look at facts dis dispassionately. You can't look at facts dispassionately. And the Gemara says, you have to understand that the pain of a Bia Rishona that a woman has with her husband is going to be fundamentally different than the pain of a Bia Rishona that she experiences at the hands of a man who is violating her. So therefore, by definition, even though, again, technically, one could say it falls under the same, it's two different types of tsar, to which the Gemara says, The other possibility is, Tsar shall piso karaglayim. Ultimately, in both say, Rabbi Rabbi says, it's the tsar of the violator spreading her legs. 
In other words, Rabbi said, the act of violation is not just about the Bia Rishona. First of all, Rabbi I want to point out, none of these things are mutually exclusive. In other words, the Tsar could be a composite, ultimately, again, of all of the trauma she experiences. The getting thrown down, right? The violator for, right, forcing himself upon her, right? Spreading her legs forcibly. The act of Bia Rishona, which is done forcibly. All of this is part of the Tsar. The Chinu Omer, the Gemara quotes the Pasik, quoting over here the Pasik from Yechezkel. Vatipaski es raglayech lechol over, vatarbi es taz nusayech. So we'll say actually a very, uh, very strong Pasik. The Navi Yechezkel, the Navi Yechezkel goes ahead and compares Klal Yisrael to an immoral woman who is willing to have relations with any man who passes by. Ihachi mefutanami. If that's the case, that it's the pain of the spreading of the legs. So then Lamai said again, why isn't the man who seduces a woman, why isn't he chai for that tzara as well? So I will say, there's, there are a number of things that's happening over here. There's the fact that the man who violates the woman forces her legs apart. There's a tzara in that. The Gemara also understands that perhaps inherent in, in Bia is that the woman has an uncomfortable position. So, so even in the case of Mafuta, even in the case ultimately again of the man who seduces the woman, perhaps by definition there's inherent discomfort for the woman from the position she has to assume during Bia. To which the Gemara says, Mafuta nami, so Here's a I'll give you a mashal for a woman who's seduced. La Adam it's compared to a person who says, cut my silk and you'll be potter. In other words, Rebose, what does that mean? That sometimes it could be that even when a woman engages in a consensual act of relations, there's an element of discomfort. But because it's consensual, therefore what? She's mochel, right? She forgives any tsar that may come about. So comparable to a case of a person, I will say, if I say to you, Ruvain, Come and cut, come, come, come and rip my shirt. Okay, so Ruvain damaged me, but Lamaisa, what? I forgive the damage. So what's well, actually very interesting. So the Gemara is acknowledging that perhaps just inherent in the act of Bia is just an, an element of positional discomfort for the woman. I so why, why so why isn't there tsar payment every single time there's relations? Because ultimately, because it's consensual. Even if there is some level of tsar, halacha lemaisa, again, a woman forgives, a woman is mocheles on that tsar. Tosus of Osei points out over something very interesting, which is she's mocheles on that tsar, even though what? She never articulates that particular mechila. In general, of saying, if you're going to be mochel on something, you generally, if you're going to forgive something that you're entitled to, Generally, you have to articulate it. What's interesting over here is that even though a woman is not, she doesn't articulate this mechila, situationally, because she's willingly engaging in an act of relations, we understand that that mechila is in fact present. Quite amazing. So, so listen to this. The Gemara says, uh, the Gemara says, V'yipater. So the Gemara says, Shali, but one second, one second, that's fine. But Lamai Sebo say, in these cases, remember again, she's quote unquote being mocheles, but none of these damages are coming to her. Everything is going to the father. So Sebo say, Baravua says, the wise women say, the Mufuta doesn't have tsar, which I say essentially means that when a woman engages in a consensual act of relations, there's no tsar. See, the havamina is that every act of relations always brings with it some element of tsar. I say tsar doesn't have to mean pain. Tsar could mean what? Discomfort. Kamash no. That when it's a consensual act of relations, it doesn't have to be any level of tsar. It's only, so therefore, mufuta, in, even though again, I say this is an act, remember again, to be clear, the mafuta, just because something is consensual doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's not wrong. Like in the case of the Nara, ultimately, again, this is an adult taking advantage of a young girl. It's wrong. It's wrong. Even though, again, she's quote-unquote giving her consent, Lemaisa, the Torah deems it as a wrongful act. 
But because it is quote unquote consensual, even though I will say it's hard for us to fathom how consent could be given at such a young age. And obviously I will say contemporarily, the, 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 obviously I will say this, this is a biblical framework reflecting a totally different societal setup that has absolutely no place or really no relevance in our contemporary setting. I mean, it has relevance because it's Torah, but Lamaisa, obviously we understand for, for contemporarily that a girl this age would have absolutely no valid consent. And again, for our purposes, it would be an act of pedophilia, not, not just an act of seduction or violation. Again, but le le leaving, leaving that aside, leaving that aside, halacha Lamaisa, the Gemara understands over here, because there is an element of consent, therefore there's no tsar. Contrast that ultimately with what? Contrast that with the case of Ones, where halacha Lamaisa, Halacha lemaisa, there is tsar. So the Gemara says, "V'ha'kach azinan de'islay." But we see that sometimes women do have discomfort, even in a consensual act of relations. Amr Abai, this is very interesting. Abai says, "Amr Abai, I'm really aim." My mother told me. I have no idea how this conversation got started. Right? My mother told me, "Kimaya chamimi areisha dekarcha," that when a woman has consensual relations, there might be some level of discomfort but it's like warm water or hot water on a bald head. Okay, so I guess hot water, right? Hot water, I, I can speak to this one, right? So again, hi, hot water on a bald head could be, could be uncomfortable, but, but it's not painful. It's not painful. So apparently Abai's mother was explaining to him, there could be some element of discomfort, some element of discomfort, but Lemaisa, again, not pain. Rava Amar, Amrili Bas, Rav Chista, Rava said, the daughter of Rav Chista said to me, the daughter of Rav Chista was Rava's wife. So Rava was saying, my wife told me, ki rivda de kusilta. There's sometimes the discomfort is like, like, like the piercing of a, of a blood letter's needle. In other words, it, it sometimes you just like a, a, moment, a moment of discomfort, but not real pain, not real pain. Rav Papa, Amrili Bas Rav Abba, Rav Papa said, the daughter of Rav Abba, says, Amrili Bas Abba, Bas Abba Surah, the daughter of Abba Surah said to me, Sometimes the discomfort is like the, the, the experience of hard bread against the palate. Sometimes if you eat hard bread, so it, it gives you a little bit of discomfort on the palate, but it's not pain. So I will say, what's coming out of all of these things is that there could be some level of discomfort even in consensual relations, but Lamaisa, it's that. It's discomfort and it's not pain. So because it's not pain, it doesn't rise to the threshold of tsar damages. We will say we'll tell you something interesting about this, which is which is that which is that this this idea over here, especially the first one of Abayi speaking with his mother about this kind of stuff. We will say there is an important Muster Haskell in this, which is parents have to talk to their children about sexuality. It, it, it is incredibly important because our children will learn all about the wide world of sexuality. And either they'll learn it, they'll learn it, well now they can learn it from the internet, or they'll learn it from their friends, or they'll learn it from something else. It is so much better for a parent to control the narrative. Because sometimes if you have the wrong initiation into your knowledge of sexuality, it could corrupt, it, it, it could just, it could, it could literally ruin a person, it could ruin a person. And you see from here, it sounds from us, it sounds weird that Abaye is discussing this with his mother. Again, I don't know that one has to get into this level of specificity with, with their children, but Lamaisa to begin a discussion. And again, I will say, unfortunately, and it really is unfortunately, it used to be that you could wait till children were a little bit older to engage them in some of these discussions, not anymore. We live in such a highly sexualized society. Everything is sexualized and everywhere we go, see, most of us just become a little bit like numb to it because we experience it and you see it everywhere. But Lamai said it's so incredibly important to talk to our children about these in Yonim. Because if we don't control the narrative, someone else will. That's the most Oscar from the Gemara. The Gemara goes weiter. Ha'onis no sin miyad. I just want to point out the takeaway message, the takeaway message of this is that Lamaisa, again, the first distinction between Ones and Mefata is that Ones has a, pe a penalty for tsar, pain and suffering. Pain and suffering, Mefata does not. Next. Next, ha'onis no simafat See, the ones has to pay the penalty payment immediately. The mefata lechishiyotzi. And the lechishiyotzi sounds like when he divorces her. The yarsh lechishiyotzi ishtohi. I don't understand. 
that makes it sound like the Mafata immediately marries the girl. Is that true? Rabbi Ima lechishelo yichnos. No, no, no. Rabbi says, here's what it means, Rabbi Osei. What it means is like this. If the Mafata, if the Mafata marries the girl, then he doesn't have to pay the penalty payment. If he doesn't marry the girl, then he has to pay the penalty payment. Tanya Namach Rabbi Osei that supports this. Afapi shomra Mafata nosin lechishelo yichnos. Even though we said that the Mafata ultimately pays the penalty payment, when he decides not to marry her, Boshas Upegam no Sein Miyad. was very interesting. There are, there are different buckets of payments over here. So I will say, the penalty payment, in the case of seduction, the penalty payment is only paid in the event that he doesn't marry her. If he does marry her, he does not have to pay that payment. But Allah Chalamaisa, the other payments, I will say, what are the other payments? Boshas and Pegam humiliation and depreciation, those have to be paid immediately. Those are paid immediately. And both in the case of Onis and Mefata, Now, this is very interesting. In both the case of Onis and Mefata, both the girl, he, the girl, and her father have the ability to block the marriage. So we'll say, let's analyze this. So we'll say, so now let's just, let's just, let's get our facts in order because it's very important. So the number one we've established is that Allah Chalamaisa, the payments for Ones are Tsar, Boshas, Pigam, and Kinas, right? Penalty payments, right? Those are the four. For now, Mefuta, it's everything minus Tsar. So it's Boshas, Pigam, and Kinas. But again, there's your the Kinas by Ones and Mefata. By Ones, when does he have to pay the Kinas? Does he have to pay the Kinas? Immediately. By Mefuta, by Mefata, the seducer, he only has to pay the Kinas if when? He doesn't marry her. But if he does marry her, apparently he does not have to pay the Kinas. Now, okay, let's delve a little deeper. What about the marriage itself? So the Gemara says, both in the case of Ones and Mefata, either the girl or the father have the right to say, no, we don't want the marriage. We don't want the marriage. So what's this analyze? Pishlam and Mefuta, when it comes to the seducer, it says, Ksiv, Pasik says, if the father will refuse to give his daughter to the seducer as a wife, I only know ultimately that the father has the ability to go ahead and object, to go ahead and... Oh, second. That the father has the ability to go ahead and object. Sorry. To go ahead and object. He atzma minayin. How do I know that ultimately, again, the girl has the ability to object as well? Talmud Lomar, Yima'in Mikom Makom. There was a Torah's Lashon of Yima'in, object, object. So in any situation, in other words, whoever objects, she, he has the right to object, she has the right to object, they both have the right to object. Ela Ones, so we'll say, so that's by Mefuta. It's not by Mefuta, I understand that both the girl and her father have the ability to object. Ela Ones, what about the case of violation? Bishlama ihi, I understand that she has the ability to object. Ksiv velosihia, the Pasik says, she will be to him as a wife. Midaito, it means she has to consent. And if she doesn't consent, then lamaisa, again, no marriage. Ela avia minal, and how do we know that in the case of ones of violation, that the father has the right to go ahead and object to marriage? We'll say, sect, first wide line, first wide line, lamitas on the base, amra baye, shelo yehe chote niskar. The boss said, this is very interesting. How, we, how do we know that the father has the ability to object? In order that a sinner not benefit. In other words, the boss said, because listen to this. Let's say, if, if the father would not have the right to object to the marriage, the boss said, you know what that would mean? That would mean that a man who really wants to marry a woman, but what? But what? My father is objecting to it. So what could the, what could the, what could the guy do? He could violate her. And now again, the father has no say in the marriage. That doesn't make any sense. Others are both like, so to allow the violator to marry this girl without the father having a say would reward a person for bad behavior. So Rav Amrava says it's a kavachomer. It's a kavachomer. Uma mefata shalo avar ela al dasaviha. Both in the case of mefata, where again, we'll call him Ruvain, only when again it's the das of the father. I will say, why do you only go against the dust of the father? Because since this is a case of seduction, therefore what? There was consent on behalf of the girl. So, nevertheless, in that case, both the girl and her father have the ability to object to the marriage. All the more so, 
where I both say the violator, right? The violator has gone against the das of the girl and her father. Certainly the father has the ability to object. So they're both saying, it's interesting. Both Abai and Rava are agreeing. Others will say they're agreeing on the principle. What's the principle? That both in the case of Mefuta and now in the case of Ones, both father and daughter have the ability to object. Just halacha lemaisa, how this is now we're dealing in the case of Ones, halacha lemaisa, they're arguing about how we reach that conclusion. According to Abaye, the way we reach the conclusion is shaloi hechote nisker. A sinner should not be rewarded. Rava says from Akav Chomer. So Rava lo Amar Kabaye. Rava doesn't say Kabaye. Why? Kevin the Kamashayim Knas lo Chote Niskarhu. Rava will say since the violator has to pay a penalty, so Lamaisa again that's not called Chote Niskar. Ultimately, the violator is not being rewarded. Abaye lo Amar Ke Rava. Abaye doesn't say like Rava. Why not? Mefate di ihu matzi ma'akev, avia nami matzi ma'akev. So I will say, in the case of mefute, the case of mefate, or mefate, I should say, excuse me, it was in the case of mefate, even the seducer himself, right? Reuven himself has the ability to say, I don't want to enter into this marriage. So if Reuven has the ability to go ahead and object, certainly what? The, the, the father has the ability to object. So the says, ones di ihu lo matzi ma'akev, but in the case of Ones, where again, the violator doesn't have the ability to object, perhaps the father doesn't have the ability to object as well. So again, before we get to that, so therefore again, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, everyone is agreeing on the bottom line conclusion. They're just disagreeing about how to get there. So let, let's let's reinforce this. Say for both say halacha lemaisa, Both in the case of ones and mefata, both the girl and the husband. I'm sorry, both the girl and the father have the ability to object to the marriage. Now here's the distinction. What about the perpetrator? What about the perpetrator? So I'll say that depends. In the case of ones, the perpetrator does not have a say. If the girl and the father want the marriage to occur, then he has to get married. In the case of mefata, in the case of seduction, ultimately the perpetrator has the ability to go ahead and object to the marriage as well. Incredible. Tanya idach. So the gemara is another brayse. Avapi shamru ones no sin miad kishiyotze who ain la alav klum. So we'll say this to this. Even though we said that Allah chalamaisa. In a case of where a man violates a woman, halach lamaisi has to pay the penalty payment immediately. Nevertheless, if he divorces her, ain la alav klum, she has no claim for a ksuva against him. Sigmar says, Sigmar says, Kishiyotzi, mi matzi mafikla. One second, he's not allowed to divorce her. Right? And we'll say, part of the halach over here is once a man violates a woman, he's obligated to marry her. And what? He's never permitted to divorce her. So what do you mean when he divorces her, there's no ksuva? Ema kishetetse he. Aim la alav klum. No, what I mean, Sibel says like this. This is very interesting. If she decides to leave the marriage, so Ruvain violates Rachel, Ruvain violates Rachel, and now what happens? They're married, right? They get married. They get married. So we'll say, so remember again, let's just go through the progression over here. Ruvain violates Rachel. What's the first order of business when Ruvain violates Rachel? First order of business? First order of business? Pays her the knas. After that, what's the next order of business? Sar, Boshas, Pagam. Right? All right? Then, they get married. Assuming that halacha lamaisa, assuming that halacha lamaisa, she wants to get married, the father wants them to get married, they get married. They get married. Okay? Now we'll say, what's the status of their marriage? They're never allowed to get divorced. Meaning what? He's not allowed to divorce her. But if she wants to leave the marriage, can she leave the marriage? Can she leave the marriage? Absolutely. What have we just learned, Rabbi saying? When she leaves the marriage, there's no ksuva. There's no ksuva. Apparently, Rabbi said, what we almost look at it in halacha is the knas is the ksuva. The knas is the ksuva. So therefore, should she choose to leave the marriage, Allah Chalamai says no ksuva. Mace, what happens if he dies? Now she's a widow. So yatsa kesaf knasa biksuvasa. See what I did about say. Ultimately, again, the money of her ksuva, the money of her ksuva, ultimately, again, took the form of the knas. Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda, Omer, yesh la ksuva. Rabbi Yosef really says, no, she has a ksuva. She absolutely has a ksuva. To which the Gemara says, what are they arguing about? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yesh la ksuva mana. She has a ksuva of a mana. They both say, a mana is like a what? Like a second marriage, like a second marriage ksuva. So my plea, what are they arguing about? 
Rabbanon Savri, Taima Maitakin, Rabbanon Ksuva, why did Chazal institute a Ksuva? Kedei Shalote Kala Be'ina Vlohotsiya. Rabbanon say, why did Chazal institute a Ksuva? Because they didn't want a man to be flippant about divorcing his wife. So now that there's a Ksuva, he's going to think twice before he divorces Rabbanon say, this doesn't apply in this case. Why? Why? Because Rabbanon say, in the case of the Ma'anis, in the case of the man who violates the woman, he's not allowed to divorce her. So therefore, there's no need for a Ksuva. Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yosef, on the hand, holds, Hanami mitzar la, adda amra si lo ba'in alach. We'll say it's not true. Because halach ala even though he can't technically divorce her, nevertheless, what? He can make life so miserable for her that she's going to say, fine, I want out. To prevent him from doing that, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yehuda says, halach ala he has to pay her a ksuva. Say if Rabbi say, Allah Chalamaisa, how do we paskin? So Rabbi say, we paskin that Allah Chalamaisa, there is no ksuva in these type of marriages. That Allah Chalamaisa, again, once he marries her, essentially the knas takes the form of the ksuva, which Rabbi say, to a certain degree is even advantageous mm-hmm. because Allah Chalamaisa now, whereas the ksuva is a lien, the knas is actual payment right now in addition to all the other damages. But the knas, takes the form ultimately again of the ksuva, and therefore Allah upon death or divorce, there would be no ksuva advantage. Also, we'll have to stop over here. We'll say incredible, overwhelming, fantastic Gemara tomorrow with Musa, with Halacha, no Agarata, but a lot of Hashkafa. We'll say Shkoyach.